this is the second part of our evolution in the Baha'i Faith. And if you haven't seen the first part, please take a moment to, well, a moment, about an hour, to watch that and uh, gather the main ideas there. I'll do a quick summary, but I'm relying on the fact that you've actually seen the first part to go into the second section. Uh, as a basic summary, the first part, there was a quote from the Universal House of Justice which stated that we have to be very uh, careful to see the difference between the science that is presented by modern science and the philosophical understandings or implications of it, uh, something that is often missed. We take what scientists say philosophically to be uh, exactly identical to the scientific theory itself, and these can actually be quite separate. Uh, we also saw that if we really look into the Baha'i writings, there is an ironic foreshadow, and by that I meant that individuals will say that the Baha'i take on evolutionary theory, and on other subjects, um, do not pay due respect to science, the human endeavor of science. And yet, uh, it's very strange because it is because of this intangible, non-physical, physical function of intellectual ideation, investigation, that makes Abdul Baha designate us as a kingdom apart from that of the animals. That the one thing that truly distinguishes humankind is our ability to reason, our ability to actually explore the mysteries of the universe. So it appears somewhat ironic that we would be attacked as not being, uh, how would you say, uh, respectful enough of the scientific endeavor when it is one of the fundamental, fundamental features that makes us different from animals in a Baha'i perspective. Uh, the other was a series of sort of off-repeated errors. Um, one of them particularly was that man has never been in the animal kingdom. We saw that uh, through the writings that the man was in the animal kingdom. Uh, in the Paris talks, the reality of man is his thought, not his material body. Man is part of the animal creation, that is in section 2 of Paris talks. Or intellect is one of God's greatest gifts unto men. It is the power that makes him a creature higher than the animal. It's that power. By it, man is distinguished above all other phenomenal kingdoms. So what separates us again, those are the words of Abdu'l-Baha, is actually our, our ability to actually investigate scientifically. Um, Abdu'l-Baha says in the promulgation of universal peace, a scientific man is a true index and representative of humanity. For through, through processes of inductive reasoning and research, he is informed of all that pertains to humanity its status, conditions, and happenings. He studies the human body politic, understands social problems, and weaves the web and texture of civilization. These are powers whereby man is differentiated and distinguished from all other forms of life. Again, it is a functional difference. And this is why I gave the example that, or the concept, that man is identified functionally. Uh, man is a function, not a biological entity. For if we were to encounter, in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, if we were to encounter a species, some sort of strange octopoid, <laughs> for example, on one on Europa, right, a moon of Jupiter, and that individual was capable of establishing civilization, investigating the world of reality, pondering, self-reflecting, that that would be human. In fact, Abdul Baha says, uh, Abdul Baha stated, this is quoting Shoghi Effendi. Abdul Baha stated. There are other worlds than ours which are inhabited by beings capable of knowing God. So not only can they establish civilizations, not only can they investigate science, but they actually are spiritual and religious beings. These, in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, would be human. By the definition of the kingdom of humankind, it is not a biological definition in the writings. Uh, basically that humanity is an emergent property, a function of this cosmos in which we live, uh, Abdu'l-Baha says, for example, in some answered questions, when these existing elements are gathered together according to the natural order and with perfect strength they become a magnet for the spirit and the spirit will become manifest in them in all its perfections. Uh, as he adds, uh, a thousand million years hence, one billion years, if these elements of man are gathered together and arranged in a special proportion, if they are combined according to the same method and they are affected by the same influence, exactly the same man will exist. That is not talking about the biological lineage of Homo sapiens. It's stating that there is a function that defines a kingdom. And I joked that in the last section that 
we should, in our taxonomy, our biological taxonomy of life on planet Earth, have a category for things who make biological taxonomies of everything on the planet from which they come. That would be humankind. On a different planet, that would actually be humans in a completely different biological form. So we have several problems remaining. The first is the missing link. Abdu'l-Bahá clearly states uh, the missing link will never be found. That seems heavily problematic. Uh, the second is that humanity was always human, that we were embryonic in the cosmos. And third, it sounds as if uh, humankind went from mineral to plant, and then on to animal, and then on to humankind. And it doesn't seem that biology works that way. So I'll give you the central points at the beginning. Uh, and I think most of the, if you will, the raw materials for solving it are actually present in the first video, but we're going to look at a whole bunch of quotes here today. Uh, the first one, when it comes to the missing link, it's very particularly the fact that actually humankind is not a biological entity from the standpoint of the Baha'i writings. Uh, humanity is a function, a multiply realizable function. So you cannot reduce, for example, as we're going to see, the, you know, the concept of money to the physical structure of coins, because it can be paper. You cannot uh, redu reduce it even to paper and coins, because it could be beats. It could actually be digital code. Uh, it's not the physical structure or the substructure that matters. It's actually the function and the abstract principle that actually defines it. So if you're looking for the fundamental reality of what the human kingdom is, within the biological structure, you're going to miss it just as much as you would not learn about the concept of currency by studying the metal of a coin. Um, when it comes to being embryonic in the universe, we're going to find that this is actually not confined to humankind alone. Often people in the reading take a quote related to uh, us being embryonic in the universe, and they actually place that as if that's the only in, uh, the only being that is actually particularly embryonic in the universe is humankind, but it's actually everything. And that really what we're looking at is that this is not a haphazard cosmos, that actually we are in the code built into the laws of the nature, uh, laws of nature. As we've seen in the last video, uh, everything is governed by one natural system. Uh, the Baha'i Faith acknowledges in many ways naturalism, in the sense that the cosmos itself is productive through its own laws, of uh, planets, stars, uh, <laughs> if you will, even biological entities, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom. These are written into the laws of nature. So when we come now to the last one, which is, you know, how is it that uh, you could say we went from the mineral to the animal to, sorry, the plant to the animal to human, uh, you'll see again these are functions. Uh, very clearly stated by Abdu Baha, when he's saying the mineral kingdom, he's talking about the power of cohesion. When he's talking about the plant kingdom, it is cohesion plus growth. When he's talking about the kingdom animalia, he's talking about cohesion, uh, growth, and senses, consciousness, and memory. And when it comes to humankind, it's that we can actually rise above this and move into the realms of scientific investigation, coming to know God, building civilizations, as you read, as I read earlier, sorry, they're studying the body politic and solving the problems of humankind. So, for now, we're going to turn to the missing link. Now, um, to quote the entire talk that I'm going to focus on would be onerous, but I did make sure that I left out no intermediate sections. And I'm going to try and read through, or you're going to hear, if you will, and see uh, some of the quotes, and then we're going to summarize thereafter. The Lost Link of Darwinian Theory is itself a proof that man is not an animal. How is it possible to have all the links present and that important link absent? Its absence is an indication that man has never been an animal. It will never be found. The significance is this. That the world of humanity is distinct from the animal kingdom. The material philosophers of the West declare that man belongs to the animal kingdom, whereas the philosophers of the East, such as Plato, Aristotle, and the Persians, divide the world of existence or phenomena of life into two general categories or kingdoms. One, the animal kingdom, <coughs> sorry, or world of nature, the other, the human kingdom, or the world of reason. 
Man is distinguished above the animals through his reason. The perceptions of man are two kinds, tangible and sen or sensible and reasonable, whereas the animal perceptions are limited to the senses and the tangible only. The tangible perceptions may be likened to the candle, the reasonable perceptions to the light. Calculations of mathematical problems determining the spherical form of the earth are through the reasonable perceptions. The center of gravity is a hypothesis of reason. Reason itself is not tangible, perceptible to the senses. Reason is an intellectual verity or reality. All qualities are ideal realities, not tangible realities. For instance, we say this man is scholarly man. Knowledge is an ideal attainment, not perceptible to the senses. When you see this scholarly man, your eyes do not see his knowledge, your ears cannot hear his science, nor can you sense it by taste. It is not a tangible verity. Science itself is an ideal verity. It is evident, therefore, that the perceptions of man are twofold, the reasonable and the tangible or sensible. As to the animal, <coughs> it is endowed only with the sense perception. It is lacking the reasonable perception. It cannot apprehend ideal realities. The animal cannot conceive of the earth as a sphere. Man's inventions have appeared through the avenue of his reasonable faculties. All his scientific attainments have come through the faculty of reason. Briefly, the evidence of the intellect or reason are manifest in man. By them he is differentiated from the animal. Therefore, the animal kingdom is distinct and inferior to humankind. Abdul Baha says the missing link basically in a sense is a pipe dream. But he immediately after says that is because the world of humanity is distinct from the animal kingdom. And he's going through this and he's saying, well, it's because what humanity is is an ideal verity, an intangible reality, that biologically we have the same structures, if you will, as the kingdom animalia, but animals do not have this reasonable perception, this scientific investigation that extends beyond the natural senses of the animal, and that this is not something physical. He keeps saying it is an ideal reality, an intangible verity. It is not something that is physical, but the materialistic philosophers are looking for something physical. That's the context of the talk. The reason why you cannot find the missing link is you're kind of trying to say that there's a physical structure that is reason and science, when an actual fact man is distinguished by intangible ideal verities. And as we saw in the last section, the first part of this deepening, that uh, that in itself is not reducible to the physical structure of humankind. It is a function. It is a emergent property of a purely natural process within our universe that gives rise to life that is capable of knowing God and capable of investigating the realities of the universe, that is man, not our biological structure. So this concept that we saw just as I started in the introduction and the summary in the last section, that one billion years hence, if actually there is through an evolutionary process, which we're told, and again, watch part one, uh, through an evolutionary process where uh, a biological organism comes to be self realizing comes to reach out and begin to understand the cosmos and has this intangible ideal reality, that is man. This is why the missing link cannot be found, because it's looking in the wrong place. This is studying nickel to understand the concept of currency. You think of the physical presence of seashells, if you will, does not tell us that those physical seashells were utilized as a currency within some culture, some ancient culture. We can see beads and we can see the physical structure of these beads, but that doesn't, we can't see the physical concept of actually a currency of exchange in the structure of the beads. So you can have one seashell that was actually currency, say currency in the Persian Gulf, and you can actually have another seashell on the west coast of Canada, and that was not a currency. It's not the physical structure. So if you're looking at the physical structure to find the missing link, you're going, you're missing the point, is what I believe Abdul Baha is saying. So can we find more primordial ancestors of humankind, of human Homo sapiens? Of course we can. Actually, in the writings of Abdul Baha, he clearly states we one time had a tail, we were one time in the trees. So we and he says we stepped out of the animal kingdom. So there was this time where actually the, the, the structure of the universe was actually, we can deal with the, the multiple kingdoms here. The structure of the universe was developing cohesive elements and there was no life. It was purely the mineral kingdom. 
then from that we hear within the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá that all of a sudden life began through a natural process. And uh, um, we see that in that life, the animal kingdom, there was not the, the ability to move and have senses. Uh, that is the animal kingdom within the Baha'i writings. We then had the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom progressed and evolved according to its environment, and eventually the light of that essential reality came in through a structure, right, a complex structure, that was able to, the analogy used in the previous section was to be a mirror unto the sun of reality and reflect the reality of consciousness itself, that was able to leap above all of kingdom, the animal kingdom and reach out and study the stars. The example he gives, remember, is a spherical earth that we move around the sun, the scientific varieties of humankind. Abdul Baha is telling us that we cannot find the missing link because we're looking in the wrong place for that kingdom. The kingdom of humankind is not something he explicitly states, something you can taste, something you can smell, something you can see. It is an ideal reality embodied in multiple different forms. So now, now we turn to the embryo, the matrix, and man. So we're going to start with a couple of quotes and then we'll summarize. Realizing this, we may acknowledge the fact that at one time man was an inmate of the sea. At another period, an invertebrate, then a vertebrate, and finally a human being standing erect. Though we admit these changes, we cannot say man is an animal. In each one of these stages are signs and evidences of his human existence and destination. Proof of this lies in the fact that in the embryo, man still resembles a worm. This embryo still progresses from one state to another, assuming different forms, until that which was potential in it, namely the human image, appears. Therefore, in the protoplasm, man is man. Conservation of the species demands it. In the world of existence, man has traversed successive degrees until he has attained the human kingdom. In each degree of his progression, he has developed the capacity for advancement to the next station condition. While in the kingdom of the mineral, he was attaining the capacity for promotion into the degree of the vegetable. In the kingdom of the vegetable, he underwent preparation for the world of the animal, and from thence he has come onward to the human degree or kingdom. Throughout this journey and progression, he has ever and always been potentially man. Was at one time man an inmate of the sea? Yes. Was he an invertebrate? Yes. Did he finally become a vertebrate and come move into the animal kingdom and then become a human being standing erect? Yes. But that which was potential, the human image, and please note that, until that which was potential in those different previous kingdoms, namely the human image, appears. So man is man in that way. Yet in the second quote he says, until he has attained the human kingdom. So in the world of existence, man traversed successive stages until he attained the human kingdom. So there is this potential image of man within the code of the universe. In order for it to come out, in the last uh, deepening we saw that he stepped out of the animal kingdom, that we have moved through in the kingdom of the mineral, the kingdom of the vegetable, the world of the animal, and from thence he has come onward to the human degree. Throughout this journey he has ever and always been potentially man. So in the laws of the universe, the arising of consciousness has been an integral part of the code of the universe. That, of course, prior to the advent of human consciousness, and remember, by human I don't mean biologically homo sapien, I mean that function and that faculty of conscious awareness, of reaching out to understand the mysteries of the universe, and to reaching out and know God. So through this we have moved through the minerals, so we had that cohesion, we then had growth, the vegetable kingdom, we then had the sentence, senses and mobility, until finally out of that animal kingdom stepped humankind, but that, that image of man has always been potential through all of them. Man has always been man. Has water always been water? It's a strange question, because there was eons of time where water did not exist. Yet once hydrogen and oxygen bonded together, 
you suddenly had the qualities of water that did not exist prior to that. They are an example of an emergent property, where the component parts come together and suddenly you have properties of the whole that are not actually within the component parts themselves. And this is actually what Abdu'l-Baha has told us humankind is. This emergent property, once the elements have combined according to a natural system, and according, if you recall, to evolutionary processes. Yet, throughout they have ever and always been potentially man. Yes, just as water has ever and always been potentially water. It is written in the code and the laws of the universe that consciousness is a byproduct of life moving from, for, sorry, from mineral to plant to animal and then giving birth to a being capable of knowing the universe. It is necessary, therefore, that we should know what each of the important existences was in the beginning. For there is no doubt that in the beginning the origin was one. The origin of all numbers is one and not two. Then it is evident that in the beginning matter was one, and that one matter appeared in different aspects in each element. Thus various forms were produced, and these various aspects, as they were produced, became permanent, and each element was specialized. But this permanence was not definite, and did not attain realization and perfect existence until after a very long time. So you have this sense where there's this embryonic in the matrix of the universe, the origin is one. There's one reality, and then out of that one reality all these elements come with their own perfections, but they existed previously in potential, but not until after a very long time did they come into being. Let's continue with the quote. And these elements became composed and organized and combined in infinite forms, or rather from the composition and combination of these elements, innumerable beings appeared. This composition and arrangement through the wisdom of God and his pre-existent might were produced from one natural organization, which was composed and combined with the greatest strength, conformable to wisdom and according to a universal law. From this it is evident that in the creation of God it is not a fortuitous composition and arrangement. For the origin of this composition is from God. It is God who makes the combination, and as, in, and as it is done according to the natural system, from each composition one being is produced and an existence is realized. But simply given that the laws of reality, allowing for this chance and change and composition and combination, uh, were not a fortuitous composition and arrangement. Simply that their reality was in potential in the laws of the universe. And that this is a done, again, quote, done according to the natural system. It is clear that they come into existence from one laboratory of might, under one natural system and one universal law. Therefore they may be compared to one another, thus the embryo of man in the womb, of the mother gradually grows and develops and appears in different forms and conditions, until in the degree of perfect beauty it reaches maturity and appears in a perfect form of the utmost grace. And in the same way, the seed of this flower which you see was in the beginning an insignificant thing, and very small, and it grew and developed in the womb of the earth, and after, appearing in various forms, came forth in this condition with perfect freshness and grace. In the same manner it is evident that this terrestrial globe, having once found existence, grew and developed in the matrix of the universe, and came forth in different forms and conditions, until gradually it attained the present perfection, and became adorned with innumerable beings, and appeared as a finished organization. Then it is clear that original matter, which was in the embryonic state, and the mingled and composed elements, which were its earliest forms, gradually grew and developed during many ages and cycles, passing from one shape and form to another, until they appeared in this perfection, this system, this organization, this establishment, to the supreme wisdom of God. That this laboratory of might under one natural system, one universal law. That it starts out undifferentiated, this one. And then it moves into this different elements that were themselves originally within the laws of the universe. We were given these elements through natural processes and one universal law that this came to be composed. And actually it's interesting here that it says in the same man manner it is evident that the terrestrial globe, that this planet grew and developed in the matrix of the universe. So the embryonic analogy here is being used as humankind in the matrix of the womb. 
But when he applies it, he actually applies it to planet Earth. It grew and developed in the matrix of the universe, came forth in different forms and conditions, until it gradually attained this present perfection, adorned with innumerable beings. So remember, whenever you're reading and you hear Abdu'l-Baha talking about humankind being embryonic in the matrix of the universe, try to remember this example. He says this about the planet Earth, that there was a cosmos that actually had within the laws of nature the potentiality for the arisal of stars and planets, and that in that very original arrangement there was the possibility that out of that terrestrial globe, according to one universal law and one natural system, that actually life would arise. And that once life arose, right, within the plant kingdom, you would eventually have kingdom animalia. And from there you have the potentiality passing through all these kingdoms for the arising of a conscious being capable of knowing God. So this embryonic state is being applied here to the planet Earth. Let's continue. Let us return to our subject man. In the beginning of his existence in the womb of the Earth, like the embryo in the womb of the mother, gradually grew and developed, and passed from one form to another, from one shape to another, until he appeared with his beauty and perfection, his force and his power. It is certain that in the beginning he had not this loveliness and grace and elegance, that he only by degrees attained this shape, this form, this beauty, this grace. There is no doubt that the human embryo did not at once appear in this form, neither did it then become the manifestation of the words, Blessed therefore be God, the most excellent of makers. Gradually it passed through various conditions and different shapes, until it attained this form and beauty, this perfection, grace, and loveliness. Thus it is evident and confirmed that the development and growth of man on this earth until he reached this present perfection, resembled the growth and development of the embryo in the womb of the mother. By degrees it passed from condition to condition, from form to form, from one shape to another. For this is according to the requirements of the universal system and divine law. That is to say, the embryo passes through different states and reverses numerous degrees until it reaches the form in which it manifests the words, Praise be to God, the best of creators, and until the signs of reason and maturity appear. And in the same way, man's existence on this earth from the beginning until it reaches the state, form, and condition necessarily lasts a long time, goes through many degrees until it reaches this condition, but from the beginning of man's existence, he is a distinct species. I ask you to return again to the previous video. Amnibar actually states, for those who recall the first video, that humankind moves uh, all the way through the animal kingdom comes up actually to a point where it has this form, but actually biologically, but is still not the emblem of that quote, blessed therefore be God the most excellent of makers. So structurally we're already here, and it says we actually climb up the ladder of civilization, so we begin to become more intelligent and more sophisticated, but we still haven't become what he actually calls man. Um, Again, this obviously then makes it exceedingly difficult to, to, to find a concept of the missing link, because he's defining man as appearing after our biological form looks like this. That that faculty of reason, of expansive ideation, of our intellect reaching out and understanding the universe, reaching up to our Creator, came after we biologically looked like we currently do. This is very important, but that, that function, that capacity, that capability was always in the embryo of the mother. That, but that we move from condition to condition, from form to form, to structure to structure, and remember we come to this grace and this form, and then we, through the ladder of civilization, then become able to manifest this, these, these ideal verities and these ideal qualities. But that this has to happen, quote, for this is according to the requirement of the universal system and divine law. That is to say, he says, the embryo passes through different states, traverses numerous degrees, until it reaches the form in which it manifests the world, words, praise be to God, the best of all creators. Until the signs of reason and maturity appear. So you can finally have this, uh, and again, this is by a slow process, but from the beginning, man's existence, he is a distinct species. Why is that? Because if man is functionally defined as being 
an intellectual verity, an abstract reality, an abstract function. Those are the properties and qualities of water that have always been water, right? And yet have not yet appeared through the unfolding of this universal law. In the same way, the embryo of man in the womb of the mother was at first in a strange form, and this body passes from shape to shape, state to state, form to form, until it appears in the utmost beauty and perfection. But even when in the womb of the mother, in this strange form, entirely different from this present form and figure, he is the embryo of a superior species, and not of the animal. His species and essence undergo no change. Now, admitting that the traces of organs which have disappeared actually exist, and this is not a proof of the impermanence, and the non-originality of the species, at the most it proves that the form, the fashion, and the organs of man have progressed. Man was always a distinct species, he's a man, not an animal. So if the embryo of man in the womb of the mother passes from one form to another, so that the second form in no way resembles the first, is this a proof that the species has changed? That it was at first an animal, and that its organs progressed and developed until it became a man? No indeed. How puerile and unfounded is this idea and this thought, for the proof of the originality of the human species and of the permanency of the nature of man is clear and evident. So do we have a radical shifting of form and condition, a shifting of our organs, a shifting of our physical bodily structure? Yes, and yet man has always been man, and this has got to be squared because we're looking at, we have to, no pun intended here, we have to look at the matrix of all of these different quotes. We can't forget the preceding sections and the preceding talk, so I'll make some parallel points here. Was the terrestrial globe always the terrestrial globe, though in different form, states, and conditions? Yes. Abdu'l-Baha told us that at the beginning of this talk. The terrestrial globe was always the terrestrial globe, though in different forms, states, and conditions, even back to the origin of all reality being one. Was the human species always the human species, though in different forms, states, and conditions. Yes, Abdu'l-Baha tells us that at the end of the talk. Has the terrestrial globe undergone change? Actually, yes. Its reality passed through stages. He uses the embryonic, in the womb of the mother, analogy for the planet. So, it has always been the terrestrial globe, code in the laws of the universe, that is what Abdu'l-Baha told us in the original analogy. Has the human species undergone change like that terrestrial globe, the analogy he was using? Yes, its reality passed through stages. Thus it has always been man, though, coded in the laws of the universe. That's what Abdu'l-Baha says at the end of the talk we've been reading. Has the actual form, stating condition of the terrestrial globe changed? Yes. Has that of humankind changed? Yes. So it's very important to watch the actual analogy being used. He's applying it to humans and to the planet. He actually, if you listen carefully and read the talk carefully, you see he applies it to actually the very elements of the periodic table of the elements. Now they themselves were in the origin run, and a natural process unfolded what you now see as their qualities and attributes that were actually in the code of creation from the beginning. They were always water, always gold, always hydrogen, and yet their form and structure had not yet been unfolded. And that all of this, and remember, all of this happens according to one natural system, but simply this, that neither the terrestrial globe nor humankind was a fortuitous composition and arrangement. At this point, I want to really take note that this concept, this language regarding humankind always having been a distinct species, an embryonic in the universe, in the Baha'i writings is not exclusive to humankind or Homo sapiens. Let's listen to a talk by Abdu'l-Baha. Does man in the beginning possess mind and spirit? Or are they an outcome of his evolution? In the beginning of the existence, a man on the terrestrial globe resembles his formation in the womb of the mother. The embryo in the womb of the mother gradually grows and develops until birth, after which it continues to grow and develop until it reaches the age of discretion and maturity. Though in infancy the signs of the mind and spirit appear in man, they do not reach the decree of perfection, 
they are imperfect. Only when man attains maturity <coughs> do the mind and spirit appear and become evident in the utmost perfection. So also the formation of man in the matrix of the world was in the beginning like the embryo. Then gradually he made progress in perfectness and grew and developed until he reached the stage of maturity when the mind and spirit became visible in the greatest power. In the beginning of his formation, the mind and the spirit also existed, but they were hidden. Later, they were manifested. In the womb of the world, mind and spirit all exist, also existed in the embryo, but they were concealed afterward they appeared. So it is that in the sea the tree exists, but is hidden and concealed. When it develops and grows, the complete tree appears. In the same way, the growth and development of all beings is gradual. This is the universal divine organization and the natural system. The seed does not at once become a tree. The embryo does not at once become a man. The mineral does not suddenly become a stone. No, they grow and develop gradually and attain the limit of perfection. All beings, whether large or small, were created perfect and complete from the first, but their perfections appeared in them by degrees. The organization of God is one. The evolution of existence is one. The divine system is one. Whether they be small or great beings, all are subject to one law and system. Each seed has in it, from the first, all the vegetable perfections. For example, in the seed, all the vegetable perfections exist from the beginning, but not visibly. Afterwards, little by little, they appear. So it is first the shoot which appears from the seed, then the branches, leaves, and blossoms, and fruits. But from the beginning of its existence, all these things are in the seed potentially, though not apparently. In the same way, the embryo possesses from the first all perfections, such as the spirit, the mind, the sight, the smell, the taste, in one word, all the powers, but they are not visible, and become so only by degrees. Similarly, the terrestrial globe from the beginning was created with all its elements, substances, minerals, atoms, and organisms. These only appeared by degrees, first the mineral, then the plant, then afterward animal, and finally man. But from the first these kinds and species existed, but were underdeveloped in the terrestrial globe and that appear only gradually. For the supreme organization of God and the universal natural system surrounds all beings and are all subject to this rule. When you consider this universal system, you see that there is not one of the beings which at its coming into existence has reached the limit of perfection. No, they gradually grow and develop. All beings, large or small, were comrated perfect and complete from the first. This is not a distinction within the Baha'i writings attributed only to mankind. That the evolution of existence is one, the divine system is one, and all are subject to this law and system, is unfolding of the qualities. So we can't take these statements and apply them just to humankind, as if humanity is singled out for this. And again we see in this talk, Abdu Baha says here, that the terrestrial globe from the beginning was created with all its elements, substances, minerals, atoms, organisms. Now we know that Abdu Ba clearly states, and we'll see it again coming up, that there was a time when this terrestrial globe didn't even exist, but that the perfections in it were somehow hidden, latent, until they were unfolded and made manifest thereafter. That when you consider this universal system, you see that not one of these beings, not one of these realities, remember he said atoms, universal elements, organisms, that not one of these comes into existence has reached the limit of perfection when it begins. But that it is an unfolding process. So this concept of a distinct species is not, is not singled out for humankind. It's not a distinction of man alone. All beings, whether large or small, were created perfect and complete from the first, but their perfections appear in them by degrees. But from the first these kinds and species existed. This is about that which is potential, that which is latent, that is which is unmanifest within the laws of nature. So we really have to begin as we read these the writings uh, of Abdu Baha, looking at the concept of evolution. When he's talking about mankind, when he's talking about humanity, when he says man, uh, he's not talking first about a biological organism. He's talking about a capacity, a function, an ideal verity, an intangible reality that can be embodied in multiple forms. That the cosmos itself at its beginning was one, and it has unfolded from there, pouring forth the different elements, the different 
terrestrial globes, the different stars, the different species, but that their reality was there from the beginning. It is not a fortuitous arrangement, and yet it is actually governed and follows one universal law, one natural system. We've seen this over and over and over again. But that those laws of nature, that that natural system, that that universal organization, with all these potentials within it coded within the laws of nature, as it unfolds, it gives us these different elements which come together. We then have the arising of terrestrial globes, which was there in the beginning. It then unfolds not only into the mineral world, but into the plant, the animal, and then humankind. Now, I want to look once, uh, one last shot here at a quote from Abdul Baha to again uh, um, ask your patience and look at this quote and see how all these different concepts again get applied. I chose this quote particularly. So, right, this again. So, I want to look at one final examination of a quote from Abdul Baha, and I want to flesh this one out because it's caused a lot of confusion, like many of the others previously and hope that a lot of the concepts that we brought together, both in the previous video and in this one, can help us to better understand it. So this is from Some Answered Questions. Let us suppose there was a time when some animals or even man possessed some members which have now disappeared. This is not a sufficient proof of the change in evolution of the species. For man from the beginning of the embryonic period, till he reaches the degree of maturity, goes through different forms and appearances. His aspect, his form, his appearance, and color change. He passes from one form to another, and from one appearance to another, and nevertheless, from the beginning of the embryonic period, he is of the species of man. That is to say, an embryo of man and not of an animal. But this is not at first apparent, but later becomes visible and evident. The terrestrial globe from the beginning was created with all its elements, substances, minerals, atoms, and organisms, but these attain period only by degrees, first the mineral, then the plant, and then the afterward the animal, and finally man. But from the first these kinds and species existed, but were developed in the terrestrial globe, and then appeared only gradually. For example, let us suppose man once resembled the animal, and then he now has progressed and changed. Supposing this to be true, it is still not a proof of a change of species. No, as before mentioned, it is merely like the change and alteration of an embryo of man, till it reaches the degree of reason and perfection. We will state it more clearly. Let us suppose that there was a time when man walked on his hands and feet and had a tail. The change in alteration is like that of a fetus in the womb of the mother. Although it changes and weighs and grows and develops until it reaches the perfect form, from the beginning it is a special species. We also see in the vegetable kingdom that the original species of the genus do not change and alter, but the form, color, and bulk will change and alter even progress. I wanted to read this section in the context of that which we read from the Promulgation of Universal Peace in the talks by Abbott Walker that we hear that he is a distinct species, but we just heard that about the other organisms, about the elements, about the terrestrial globe. So when he's saying that they're a distinct species, we see that he's clear there that he's talking about something that is potential within the laws of nature. Okay? That they unfold according to a universal law, a natural system. So he's pressing us to realize that we are seeing this sort of unfoldment of reality is moving from one stage to another, one condition to another. He's acknowledged that we stepped out of the animal kingdom that we had developed, and then even then actually had to climb the ladder of civilization before we became truly a spiritual being who began to manifest those ideal realities. It's just simply that we are not a fortuitous creation any more than the planet was a fortuitous creation. That we have to realize that when we're trying if you will, to find the reality of what humankind is, when we purely look to the biological and physical structure, we're missing the very reality that distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. Our ability to look back, almost prophetically billions of years, to the origin of our own universe, to study galaxies light thousands and thousands of billions of light years away, to be able to plumb the depths of the ocean and explore reality and categorize reality, to be able to categorize and give the taxonomy to the biological world, which in Abdul Baha's perspective and my own should have a category that is the human kingdom, beings capable of looking back billions of years 
and billions of light years away, and creating taxonomies of organisms. I think when we really, really get into like the core of this, um, what the Baha'i writings is trying to say is if you suddenly appeared on an alien planet, you land on the planet, and you step out, and you see some very strange, I don't know, purple tubular object, immobile, just sticking out of the ground, with like, you know, things flapping on the side of it. And then all of a sudden there's this strange creature that goes running and scurrying past amongst these strange oblong purple things. And then you look over and you see a group of strange other creatures that seem to have buildings, and they're meeting together, and they're clicking and making sounds at each other. And they seem to have structured an organized society that you are standing on mineral right next to an oblongy, weird-looking plant. You just watched an animal go by, and over there are some humans. Those things, very likely, are kingdom humania. <laughs> but they are actually humans. Biologically, no. Genealogically, no. They're not Homo sapiens. And the way that they, and we see this actually in the writings, again in the previous talk, we see that they're going to think differently than us. Of course they're going to have a different language, but their states of consciousness, we're told, are going to be very, very different because they were molded to the evolutionary process and the environment in which they were, in which they developed. So what the Baha'i Faith is telling us is that these are rational kingdoms, and these kingdoms are part of the very fabric of the cosmos in which we live. And I don't actually think that there's any reason to dispute such a thing, when it's obvious that, that certain laws of nature allow for the arising of biological organisms that come and step out of the normal kingdom animalia and suddenly can look back billions of years and actually have chemistry and physics and geology and mathematics and political science and economics. That has to be true, because we're here. And what the Baha'i Writings is telling us is that makes us different than a badger, than an ape. That makes us different than a baboon. And it would make us different than all those other species on that alien planet that aren't like that weird, so strange octopoid things that are actually creating cultures and have themselves, when we translate their language and reach out to actually understand them, that we find that they themselves self-reflect. They are meditative. They are trying to understand reality. They are reaching out into the cosmos. And they may be below us, and they may be ahead, but in a sense, they are human. So we were all embryonic in the code of the universe. We're not mere chance, but that those potentialities that were latent and hidden came through a universal system, a natural system, one law, uh, through a slow progressive process. That this slow progressive process, from lower to higher complexity, had within it, within the laws of the universe, types and kinds and species. Again, this is not limited to humankind alone. And that they began to actually be brought out through a natural system and quote, that the power of adaptation and environment molds their bodies and states of consciousness, just as our bodies and minds are suited to our planet. This is a quote from Abdu'l-Bah. And this is what gives us that picture of there being these you know, strange plants on an alien uh, planet with you know, scurrying creatures and humans, not biological humans, but functional humans. Because that functional definition of humankind is not reproducible to a biological lineage, even though it depends on the prior existence of the planet I landed on, and the existence of growing plants, and kingdom animalia for humankind to step out of. Mankind is an emergent property, not reducible to biological structures, and that this is what makes the looking for a missing link, looking for a missing link, doomed to failure, because it's like trying to understand money by studying the physical structure of coins. It's like trying to understand a theory of, say, evolution by studying the paper on which Darwin wrote his book. You're never going to understand the theory of evolution by looking at the paper that Darwin wrote on, or the code you read it on. That is not the right place to be looking, because even the theory of evolution itself 
is an ideal verity, an intangible reality. We are in the end former amoebas <laughs> that have come to create technologies to understand reality and be able to look back all the way to the dawn of reality and understand the laws of the natural system that God has actually given us and we see that hidden in their depths are those things that we may see now there are more things hidden to come to unfold through that natural system and that we are one of those wondrous beings that lay coded in the reality of creation from its beginning. Thank you very much.